It has nothing to do with evidence, certainly nothing to do with common sense. Um, so we're in the field of nutrition, there's been a lot of misinformation. Look at this amazing fractal cauliflower. It scares me. There's got to be all kinds of anti-nutrients -nu and toxins in there that we're not supposed to eat it, I'm sure. But I, I have eaten it before. But that is beautiful, and it represents the infinite complexity of food, which can never be reproduced, certainly never analyzed with any kind of efficiency. So when you look at the nutrition facts, of course, we're still ca counting calories. We're looking at the amount of building blocks, the carbs, the proteins, the lipids, the vitamins, the minerals. And, you know, we think that that's telling us something about nutrition, and it really isn't. So really, if you look at the word information, it means to put form into. And when I look back at this cauliflower, there's infinite information in that. I can actually explain a little later that that's a true statement. It's not just a, a metaphor. Um, and this is how our genes work, and this is how our bodies work is we've gone through this decade, for a decade now, okay, after the first draft of the H Human Genome Project uh, came to completion, we entered a post-genomic reality. And many don't know this. Uh, my colleague, Jonathan Latham, from Independent Science News, he uh, revealed that the tobacco industry was behind uh, the funding of the Human Genome Project, because what a great way to distract from the obvious fact that, you know, your product is producing cancer, an environmental cause. Well, let's just look for the answer to all disease, the holy grail in the human genome, the three billion base pairs that make up, you know, the uh, genome in our cells. And so the idea is that we enter this new realm where we realize there's only 23,000 protein coding genes, but yet there's over 100,000 proteins in the human body. I mean, they were expecting to find at least enough in the blueprint to explain the existence of our form. And, I mean, 23,000 is nothing. So we entered a whole new world historical place, which still, if you go look at the mainstream news aggregators like Google, every then there's articles on how a new gene that's uh, connected with liberalism emerged. I mean, they're, they're still doing, like, this is medieval, the, the level of non-intelligence out there. But when it comes to... <laughs> I, that's insulting the medieval ages, sorry. They, they had probably a lot better sense than we do. But, um, anyway, so food puts information into our body. It is composed of information, is what I'm trying to say in a fancy way. Um, and so now the focus is on what's beyond the control of the genes or above it, epigenetics, which includes everything, you know, that we can choose to expose ourselves to, including even thoughts, because the mind-body cascade of events from top down gear into real physiological processes that have been, you know, molecularly validated. Like, for example, fight or flight. Your doctor says you're, you have cancer. It doesn't tell you that you have ductal carcinoma in situ, which had no symptoms when you got your mammogram. It's not even cancer. In fact, it's a benign growth of epithelial origin, according to a new National Cancer Institute-funded uh, panel. In other words, you think you have cancer. You don't. It's benign, like millions of women were told. And then you get this adrenaline response, because the nocebo effect, the adrenaline activates g glycoprotein in your cells, which is basically what causes multi-drug resistance. So you can actually feed the cancer on a molecular level based on just the response to inaccurate information. So mind-body medicine and just this whole cascade, I mean, it's, just, it's clearly hyper-relevant when, you, when you're looking at this new uh, view of the body and nutrition, epigenetics. Okay, so, and there's also a field of nutrigenomics and nutritional genetics that look at nutrient gene interactions. So there's like these very uh, interesting new disciplines that have emerged because they're acknowledging that food isn't just, again, building blocks for the body and a source of energy or fuel, like you put gas inside of your fuel tank. Rather, it's a source of information. And we know now through studies on things like uh, SNPs or mutations within your genome that you can be more susceptible to certain types of diseases uh, if you have them. But you, we also now just know even having methyl donors like folate in adequate quantities can neutralize the adverse effects of those, uh, quote, variations. So, you know, this is actually not really that new after the, you know, uh, post-genomic revolution. There's been a lot of interest in this. So just to give you a sense for how much information and intelligence is embodied in something as simple as, 
an apple, I wish I'd brought one, is that there's something called Leventhal's paradox, which is if you look at the primary sequence of a protein, the amino acids linked together in this long chain, that's the primary structure. And you know, in classical molecular biology, um, it was considered that information only resides within the primary structure, and that it's the obviously the nucleic acids in your genome, the DNA, that carries all the information that makes all of this possible, this body, right? Really bad, you know, idea, and it's been disproven. So in order for a protein, and, you know, apples do contain protein, to fold into its natural state, known as its native conformation, it has to go through so many degrees of freedom that there's not enough time in the universe so far to even allow it to go through all of those uh, different folded states to the right one that it conforms to. Um, and that's called Leventhal's uh, paradox, is that you can't explain this um, folding from primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, quaternary structure uh, based on the information certainly within the primary sequence of amino acids. You know, so the same applies to the DNA generally, is there's still this really ridiculous view that, oh, if we find out what's in your genes, we can explain something about your health. Like, we can't even explain how a protein folds. It, it's a mystery, but it does, and it's such a specific way. There's only one properly folded confirmation for a protein in its natural state. Now consider that if that design, that blueprint, that intelligence is there so that our bodies can be whole and healthy, if you start genetically modifying things or radiating them with gamma radiation and destroying the molecular bonds, like what do you think you do to the information? It is a miracle that you and I are even here standing looking somewhat healthy given what we have been exposed to for generations now. Um, and that's a really a profound fact. It speaks again to how all healing is truly self-healing and, and why we have to also consider that, that what's going on in the planet, especially later with Jeffrey Smith's talk, and hopefully uh, David Perlmutter will also come up because it was, they have the most fascinating discussion yesterday about the connection between glyphosate and you know, the bacteria and how that causes all kinds of disease. What we're doing right now is the worst possible human experiment uh, when it comes to, if you just look as simple as creating a conventional apple, but this is a, a food and thought one, right? There's a bite in it too, wow. Okay, so it's not a poison apple then. Um, let's see. Yeah, and I was just putting this image here to show you faux food, you know, it's just chemical excreta processed like wheat dough with sugar from a GMO corn plant and all kinds of preservatives. Can you imagine the difference in information between that and this? And how is it going to instruct and properly educate our genome to express itself correctly, given the infinite complexity of foods that we co-developed with for many, many generations? I won't say billions of years, because there are probably some creationists out there, but going back to the, uh, you know, Eden, same, same metaphor. <laughs> So the central dogma has been completely overturned, which was, of course, the information flow goes from your DNA to your RNA to proteins, and they really don't go back. And this is actually something that even the, you know, person who came up with this, um, uh, Craig, he, he, he even says it's possible that, that there is two-way information flow. So even he accepted that this was never truly, you know, his, his ultimate opinion. It was just a hypothesis. So now we know based on prion diseases, okay? So you know about Alzheimer's, there's misfolded proteins, and they conform to different types of arrangements, um, like a beta sheet is formed, there's a different geometric arrangement, and that causes the information to be passed laterally to other healthy proteins in the brain. It's just this terrible effect of everything misfolding. But it's, it's, it's information, that information that's being laterally communicated. So there's no infectious agent, there's no virus, which is, you know, viruses are pieces of genetic information looking for chromosomes, basically. There's no, so in other words, information can be passed through confirmation. So when we start understanding that, that when we eat an apple with all of these complex lipids and proteins and fats folded in a specific way, that's actually kind of moving through us like a wave of information, and it's helping our cells to attain their proper native confirmation. Um, there are a lot of examples now where this whole concept of the unidirectional flow of information from the DNA out is completely overturned. 
Retroviruses are a good example. They have reverse transcriptase and they encode information directly into our DNA going the other direction. Um, HIV is an example of that. And it can change forever our genome. Let's see. So we talked about the epigenetic revolution. Same thing, there's so much burgeoning research on this topic now. And the implications, of course, are very profound that we can alter <laughs> in real time the offspring that we have, for example. New research came out last year showing that the sperm can respond to um, the behaviors in the cells through information transfer. These little nanoparticles called exosomes can carry things like microRNA and can go encode into the sperm. So if you're a carpenter and you have a certain set of proteins doing a certain type of behavior, that information could actually get transferred to the sperm so that your child is able to express these traits. And that's, so that's the Lamarckian view, which Darwin in theory on evolution kind of canceled, you know, which is the idea that you can't pass down those traits directly. So this is changing a lot. This means if you're a mother and you give birth to a child and, and you're forced to take intrapartum antibiotics at that moment, you know, they, they, you can't implant that next generation of healthy bacteria into your child. Those sorts of effects could, could you know, absolutely affect the, all generations of the future going down that germline. Um, so we're in a totally different era. Okay. What is this? So anyway, this is just the whole notion that, you know, it's like we're at this point in nutrition and actually just generally almost every topic where the, you know, sort of the, the term science comes up where we think that the finger pointing at the moon it is the moon itself. So we've now thought that like the nutrition data on a package tells you something about what this food is and what it's going to do to your body. It's not true. It's complete myopia. 